Well, so uh, today we'll, uh, we'll talk about groups and Vagarta integration. Very interesting thing. So this is a continuation actually of the first lecture. But uh, if you miss that, no problem. I mean, it will be somehow uh, self-contained, just assuming that you know a bit of, uh, of probability to very basic things. So what happened last time is that uh, we discovered that the normal and the Poisson laws are very, very dated to the uh, symmetric group and also orthogonal groups, and they had some questions left, and that they will get complete and uh, solve it, not only for the symmetric orthogonal, but uh, also for many other groups, like reflections, we have a lot of fun. So algebra and uh, probability, that's the plan for today. Let's find this presentation. And uh, assuming somehow that yeah, yeah, just uh, you know a little bit of, uh, of probability, the algebra is supposed to be self-contained and uh, we'll recall the definition of groups, but then uh, we'll get into more and more complicated things. So the end won't be uh, that self-contained. Well, anyway, that's the 45 minute presentation that I have. Hope it helps. It's really very beautiful. So what's the plan? Uh, we'll start with uh, having some fun with groups, definition of that examples very concrete, and then in particular the reflection groups try to compute their uh, loss of characters, uh, like uh, we did last time for, uh, for the symmetric group. And then we'll go to the continuous case where things are really complicated. So they will have to learn a bit compact groups like Peter White theory, things like that, Schur White duality, Brouwer, Taraka, and then with that we'll develop what's called the Weingarten integration. Extremely powerful method, uh, with, uh, which can be used for uh, basically uh, solving anything so very interesting stuff let's get started so uh group theory uh i'm not a group theorist from the second uh from the 20th century i'm a personally i'm a group theorist from the 18th or the 19th century so for me the a group means a close to group of the unitary group i mean it's groups of matrices like they used to be in the good old times, and I'm not the only one, or quite a bunch of people believing that uh, this, this old, old point of view where groups used to be groups of matrices is very, very, very good. And uh, we'll be back sometime uh, in the 21st century. So uh, we'll forget all these abstract, uh, abstract things from the 20th century where a group is a set with a multiplication or whatever, you don't really understand what you're doing. And uh, we're getting back to matrices. So my first claim is that in the finite case, we're not losing anything. All the finite groups are there. They appear as groups of uh, unitary matrices. Why? Because uh, we have Kelly theorem. So any finite group appears as a permutation group. That's something that you probably know. If you don't, it's very simple. So uh, you just make the group acting on itself. So it's permutation on itself, OK? So that's the symmetric group uh, on n elements and being the order of the group, if you want. And the action is simple by multiplication. I mean, it's just work. It's a group morphism. It's injective everything. So it's a sub. Very nice. So all the finite groups are permutation groups. No need to, to be abstract. A finite group is not a group, not a finite set with a multiplication everything. It's a permutation group, if you want something very concrete. And you can do it even better. It's actually a unitary group. Why? Because, uh, of course, it's enough for today for permutations. But if you take the coordinate axis of Rn, well, you can permute them, right? <laughs> These are the so-called permutation matrices. I mean, you can permute them to get some orthogonal transformations there, of course, which are very simple. So Sn is a group of orthogonal matrices, so in particular of unitary, if you want. Okay, so you have Ku, which is very simple, the first theorem, and then this is just a remark here. So. Uh, the coordinate axis can be permuted. So if you combine them, you reach to the conclusion that any finite group is a group of unitary matrices. Actually, even orthogonal, but it's better to do it with the unitary group. We'll see later. Some groups are uh, naturally, even finite groups are naturally groups of unitary matrices. I mean, there's just uh, these theorems here are something abstract. I mean, uh, just a matter of saying that we're not losing objects. But in practice, to any group, there is a, a certain n which does the job in a very good way. And also, sometimes, you uh, need unitary matrices. OK, basic examples now. Yeah, let's take a look. So the cyclic groups, 
Well, you cycle the coordinate axis of Rn, right? These are the so-called cyclic matrices, like ones like this, and then some ones like this, and the zero everywhere. Then you have the diedral groups. Uh, so what's the diedral group? It's the symmetric group of the of the n gon. But now you can uh, you look at the coordinate axis. You take, for instance, the one point length one on each coordinate axis. This form an n gon, a regular n gon. So you can permute them. Okay, it's uh, it's the same thing as for the cyclic group. Now the permutation group. That's uh, what we just uh, discussed before, permuting the coordinate axis. So you see, these first three examples are some of the same uh, the same nature. Uh, the remark, however, for instance, you see that the general group has order two n. So if you apply Cayley and that, you will get it inside O two n, and that's bad. So it's better to do it with uh, with O n. You see. So uh, I mean, the n is naturally a subgroup of S n. No need to use Cayley and do it as a group of S two n. So to any group, you have to think a bit to see what's the n which does the job. If you need to retire matrices or not, so yeah, that's how it works. So have psychic diadral permutations. Now, if we have permutations, uh, well, you we have a sort of reflection group. So the first one is the hyperoctahedral one. This is the symmetric group of the unit cube in R n. By unit, I mean center that's zero, let's say, and uh, the the edges have size two. I mean the the coordinates of the vertices are all kinds of uh, plus minus one combinations two to the power n of them. So there's the hyperoctahedral group. Uh, as matrices, now these are exactly permutation matrices. Permutation matrix means uh, you have zero and ones, and uh, each row, each column contains exactly a one. It's a uh, permutation. Now, uh, hyperoctahedral groups are exactly these permutation matrices, but instead of ones, the non-zero entities you can put also minus ones. That's uh, uh, very easy. I mean, the, you see, I mean the the cube. Of course, you can uh, permute it somehow. Uh, well, yeah, let's do it. Uh, so H n is the symmetric group of the cube. Now this is the same as the symmetry group of the n coordinate axis. So what kind of symmetries do these coordinate axis have? You can of course permute them. So we have S n inside. But you can also flip each of them. So these flips correspond to the signs that you can put there. It's a so-called risk product or semi-direct product of Sn by n copies of Z2 algebraically. Okay, now if you have this, uh, we, we can do the same thing, but a bit more abstractly, instead of putting uh, signs, we can put roots of unity of arbitrary order. So uh, or even uh, these are the so-called reflection groups of the Bowling Mater, or you can just put arbitrary numbers on the unit circle inside your permutation matrices. So if you do this, you get the most general reflection group, uh, the biggest one, which is called Kn. And actually, this is not finite, of course, but it somehow it belongs to this uh, this family of, uh, of examples. This it's an increasing family. You have Zn, Dn, Sn. H N K N and actually between S N and K N you, know, you have all these things that we'll talk about later. Later, where you take a permutation matrix and replace the ones with arbitrary roots of unity of order S, let's say. For S is one, you get the symmetry group, S is two, you get the hyperoctahedral group, S is infinity, you get K N. So these are the things uh, that we would like to have uh, fun with to, to start with, and later we'll, uh, we'll get to the continuous case. Now, uh, yeah, let's talk a bit, uh, however, about the continuous case too. So, uh, of course, we have KN, as I told you, this is not finite. What are the main example? Orthogonal unitary, and special orthogonal and unitary, defining the, the determinants. Also, the symplectic group, which is uh, like this. It's only defined for n, even more, it's a bit more complicated. But that's, by the way, that's the notation that I will use, because there are two kinds of notations for the symplectic group. I will always, no matter what kind of group I have, finite, compact, whatever, n will be the dimension where it naturally lives. So the symplectic group, yeah, I will denote it as pair one, which naturally lives inside un. It's defined for any one. And as a remark here, we'll get back to this later. You see, all these groups are smooth, right? So they're a uh, bit for now. I mean, they're smooth manifolds. See infinities, or they're Lie groups. 
And in fact, uh, but this is not trivial, one can show that the closed subgroups that are interested in exactly the Popaki groups. So back to this, uh, we'll be back to this later. Now, let's get to what uh, we're interested in. So it's somehow continuing what we did last time. We're interested in characters and their roles. So you know, a closed subgroup, you just take the trace of matrices. So it's a variable, right, over your group. It's called character, main character. We're interested in its uh, distribution with respect to the uniform measure on the, on the group. So uh, that, that's somehow the main problem about, uh, about the group, no matter if you're algebraist or probabilist or analyst or uh, geometer. It is the main problem computing this law. So what we did last time is that uh, we've seen that for the symmetric group, uh, well, this character is, of course, uh, the number of fixed points. I mean, you take a permutation matrix, the ones on the diagonal correspond to the fixed points. So it's the number of fixed points. And the law is Poisson in the large in limit. So we did it with this inclusion exclusion somehow. We, uh, we found this by just by having some fun with the permutations, but it's actually very deep. That's the beginning of something interesting. Now, uh, well, more generally, we talked also about truncated characters. So once you have Poisson of one, uh, let's have as well Poisson of t. So uh, for getting Poisson of t, uh, you, you truncate the character in terms of summing everything. You sum up to up to up to t, t between zero and one, truncate. So uh, that's a general definition. I mean, it works for any closed group. You can call this truncated character. It's a truncation character, right? And we've seen last time, once again, inclusion, exclusion, that for the symmetric group, of course, that's the, uh, the truncated character is fixed points, but not from one end, just from a truncation of one end. Follows the plus one of t law, then goes to infinity limit. That was the main result from the last time. So, uh, yeah, what was the proof? Uh, my inclusion exclusion, so I remind you, the basic thing which is very beautiful is that uh, this thing here, probability chi to be zero, this means the probability for an unknown permutation to be a derangement, not to have fixed points, can be computed via inclusion exclusion, and you get exactly the series of one over e. That's extremely beautiful. Now in general, well, if you have this, you can modify things a bit, you can compute the probability for a character to be k, I mean to have k fixed points, you get plus one of one, and then you can add your t, you get plus one of t, I mean everything comes from uh, from here. Now this was the, the proof that uh, we found last time. Now uh, you can do it also via other methods, so here's another proof which is quite fine. We had the moment method, so uh, here it's very interesting variables over the symmetric group Sn, right? And uh, we know how to integrate over Sn. So if you take a product of, uh, of matrix coordinates, you have this n square matrix coordinates, you want to integrate such a monomial, here is your formula. So it's just some factorials, okay? So yeah, clear, I mean. And uh, well, with this, of course, you can compute everything in particular moments if you want of these uh, characters and you get it. So this formula, you get, uh, you get anything, of course. You can integrate over s and you're done. Basically, this is somehow a bit better. We'll see later that it is in fact even better. Now, uh, let's go to the other groups. So, uh, let's see, uh, with respect to the list that we have, we're exactly in the middle here. So we have the results about the SN, but uh, <coughs> in order to things to be complete first, we have to go first at cyclic groups <coughs> and the other groups, which are presumably very simple. And then to those complicated things for uh, reflection groups, which I can. So let's do first the easy part now. Uh, for cyclic groups, we get a Bernoulli. Why? Because the cyclic matrices, <coughs> oops, I was telling you, you have ones and ones, and the rest is zero. So there's nothing on the diagonal. So the only case where the diagonal is, has no zero entries is for the identity. So the, well, I mean, it's just clear you know, in matrix system. If you cyclically permute something, the number of fixed points is zero. Yeah, unless you have the identity. So uh, you get this Bernoulli law, right? It's either zero fixed points or all the points are fixed. And all point fixed happens with probability one over n because just identity. 
out of the NI element satisfies it. All the rest goes to delta zero. So this is clear now. Uh, this is the character where it's from K. If you want to get anything interesting, you get the, the same thing. I mean, just the, here the identity, the contribution will be modified a bit. The asymptotics also of this not very interesting. So uh, actually, yeah, it's not interesting. Actually, we don't have convolution semi groups as the problem. So um, you learned from last time on this Poisson and normal uh, laws, there are convolution semi groups as something very deep. And, uh, doesn't appear here as well. Uh, these are very simple examples. The sigli groups but are, are bad somehow. For the, the other groups, once again, these are bad. I mean, now uh, we get some kind of Bernoulli things, a bit more complicated. But once again, these are not interesting. We don't get homogeneous semi groups. So let's see what we get. Uh, well, there are two cases, and is even odd because you have n symmet the general group consists of uh, n symmetries and n rotations, right? These are the symmetries of n and gone. The rotations, of course, they have zero fixed points unless the identity which has n fixed points. But now symmetries, you think, for instance, any three a triangle, the symmetry has this point fixed, right? It's for a pentagon. So uh, when n is uh, odd, you have fixed points for the symmetries. When n is even like squares, or hexagons, whatever, uh, you don't have fixed points. So you get these uh, measures over here. Now, let's go to more complicated things, or reflections. So, uh, uh, as I told you, I pair the general group, there are several ways of defining it. So first is the symmetric group of the hypercube, or you can just take the coordinate axis. It's exactly the same thing. I mean, flipping the cube is the same as flipping the whole uh, system of coordinate axis. Or in terms of matrices, it's are permutation-like, but uh, with plus minus one uh, non-zero entries. Now the computation, uh, well, you can do it. We have two methods, inclusion, exclusion, or this kind of very concrete integration over SN with combinatorics. So you get this formula here. <laughs> and the truncated character in the, in the end goes to infinity limits. So it's just combinatorics, it becomes more complicated. It's like the same computation for the symmetric group, but now it's signed. You have all these signs everywhere. And uh, you see, first of all, it's, uh, it's supported by Z now, not, on, not only by positive integers, because if you have minus ones in your matrix, the trace can be negative too, right? So it's supported by Z. And the density is given by this beast here, uh, which actually beast is something well known. It's called the Bessel function. So this is exactly the same slide, but I wrote this like this. So the density is this guy, which is called, it's a well-known function, Bessel of the first kind. And this, these functions have very interesting properties. In particular, you can deduce from this that these uh, measures form a convolution saving group, which is very interesting. So these are called Bessel laws. Okay, now, uh, well, more generally, you know, for getting to more complicated reflection groups, let's clarify a bit the uh, uh, relation between Poisson and Bessel. So actually, these are uh, the general class of measures which uh, contains everything is the so-called compound free Poisson laws. So that's the Poisson limiting theorem, compound Poisson limiting theorem. Take any measure new, you get this, uh, compute these guys here, uh, take the convolution powers, and everything converges to something which is called compound Poisson. Now, we're interested in the case where uh, the measure new here uh, is, well, let's see, I mean, for getting Poisson, you need to put delta one, right? So we're needing uh, Bessel, actually, you need to put delta, the Bernoulli, delta one and delta minus one averaged. So in general, if you're interested in one, and also one minus one, you're actually interested in the uniform measure on the s of Schilling, and that's, uh, that's the thing. So, again, we take this general results, uh, compound Poisson limit theorem, and uh, here we plug in the measure, uniform measure on the s roots of unity. The resulting measures are called Bessel laws. So examples, s is one plus two roots of unity, that's just one. So put your delta one here, that's exactly the Poisson limit theorem, so we get Poisson. Okay, this is one is Poisson. At this is two, we obtain this, uh, once again, a real measure, which is the, the measure before, let's go back. It's exactly this thing here. And in general, where you get some other measures, will be particularly interesting in this uh, infinity. And here we obtain a law that we'll call uh, capital BT. 
Why capital B, as I told you already, uh, we have this kind of a, a bit weird notations for measure, which are, I mean, they're not weird, but they're not standard. The reason, so the, the logic in all this is that the real measures are called uh, PT, GT, PT, like this. Uh, the complex analogs are with capital letters, and later on we'll do free probability we we'll use Greek letters. So this analog says you have many, many things that you can do. Real complex classical trees, so that's why we use this, uh, these letters for everything to be, to be uniform. So here you see these measures, when are the roots of unity real, that this is one is two. So the, the real best law is the, the second one, Bt. Now the pure complex one somehow is the one at this is infinity, so that's why we not it with capital B. Okay, now with this, uh, well, here's my theorem now. So uh, for H and S, uh, which is permutation matrices with entries in ZS, that's the so-called uh, Ries product, the truncated character we follow exactly these Bessel laws. So once again, prove whatever inclusion, inclusion, something like that. Actually, so it's a bit technical, so all this goes back to work I did with uh, Bishop and Collins uh, for the peroctahedral, and then uh, Belinsky, Captain Collins for these complex reflections. So these are uh, not that uh, classical things. I mean, the complex reflection ones are uh, how many? 10, 15 years old, yeah, almost 15. So it's quite recent stuff. And uh, well, this generalizes everything that we know. So this is one, we obtain the plus one results. This is two is the Bessel one that I just told you about. As this is infinity, yeah, we obtain this uh, capital BT law for the Fourier reflection group. So uh, the combinatorial rate is very interesting here. It's, it's quite tough results. So that's kind of, uh, my paper with Beninsky, Capitan Collins called free Bessel laws because we, uh, we did their these laws and also their free analogs. Okay, so uh, well, we got here into deep research. Well, it's 15 years old, but it is tough, so it's time to stop maybe here. Which is there are not so many reflections left. So uh, this uh, group HNS, uh, that's the smaller as a series of reflection groups. You cannot have one extra parameter coming from the determinant, and that's all. Plus, you have some exceptional examples. So the complex reflection groups are classified. You have this series, an exceptional. And the series, you can add uh, one more parameter with the determinants, but then that won't change actually this computation. So we're, uh, we're done with this. Okay, now let's go to, uh, to the continuous case now, see what's going on there. So, uh, what are the main examples? Well, besides this uh, KN, so KN is continuous, but uh, it's rather, it belongs to the, this. It's a limiting case of finite groups, and it belongs to the group uh, philosophy. In the compact case, we have, of course, UN, UN, SON, SUN, of course, and a symplectic group. These are all smooth, and in fact, it's, it's all about compactly groups. These class of groups of UN are compactly groups. And uh, well, of course, we can add more things, and there are other mistoplastic, whatever, but from the point of view of the algebras, that's it. I mean, uh, these Lie algebras are classified, and these are exactly the ABCD ones. The ABCD Lie algebras correspond to these Lie groups. So uh, basically, you have to solve it for these, these guys here to compute characters, things like that, integration, and we're, uh, we're more or less done up to some exceptional examples and various operations that can be performed. So that's it, Lie algebras, then that means ABCD, and these are the groups of type uh, ABCD. No, before doing that, yeah, let's have some fun at, uh, with SU2 and SO3. So these are very interesting things. So before getting into abstract groups here, yeah, you have to know SU2 and SO3. That's extremely, extremely useful. So SU2, these are the entire matrix of the determinant one. So to compute them, of course, uh, U star is U minus one. Well, U minus one, you have this inversion formula for two matrices, which is very simple. And it's even simpler when the determinant is one because you don't have to put one over that in front. So it's just you flip the matrix, whatever, add some bars. So of course, if you say that U minus one must equal to a star, you get some uh, simple relations. And the four coefficients must be related by things like uh, adding minuses or bars. So you get something like this, AB minus B bar A bar. 
and the b this must be unitary so uh the determinant must be one if you want so a b must live on a kind of complex sphere if you want and the character now so we prove that now the character that's uh twice the real part of a right the character is the sum here now if you look at this so a b belong to a to the complex sphere in two dimensions which is the same as the a real sphere in four dimensions, right? If I write A is X plus I Y, B plus Z plus I T, this condition here means that X, Y, Z, T, the square sum up to one. So this it is exactly the same thing as the, as the sphere in four dimensions. It's denoted as three because it's a three dimensional as a manifold. And of course, the uniform measure on S2, well, you can believe me, it's the uniform measure on that sphere. So finally, what we're looking at, we take this here and we're looking at uh, this, uh, this character here, which means twice x, if you want, twice x on the sphere with the semicircle, right? So, uh, but the semicircle in post work, it's, uh, it's uh, probabilistic, it was discovered by Wigner, a Nobel Prize. So, a physicist. So, uh, yeah, this is something very interesting because we'll see later this, this law is central in free probability. It's a kind of pre Gaussian law, and you get it here like this with the, with the issue two. Very interesting thing, finally. Now, once we've done this, uh, this issue two, let's go to SO3 now. So, this is once again very funny. So, uh, this is the Euler Rodriguez formula describing the rotation uh, in R3, the elements of SO3, XYZ T being on a sphere. So is this true? This is a very important formula I mean, in any video game or whatever. When you move things, you have this matrix, which is there in the software, right? Rotating your thing. So very important formula in Leo Rodriguez. And uh, well, the modern proof is uh, that you have a double cover map from SU2 to SO3. And uh, SO3 is more or less SU2, but cut in half somehow. And the cutting in half, if you take this, but written with the uh, AB being uh, X plus IY, Z plus IT, so you'll get something with the XYZ, right? A kind of complicated formula of elements of SO3. Here it is. Now the character, uh, well, this is no longer a sphere, right? So it's, uh, it's double covered by a sphere, so you cannot uh, really do the same trick. But if you think a bit abstract in this double cover thing, means that the fundamental representation of SO3, uh, well, it's a more squared zero, square of the semicircular. And uh, I mean, it's the adjoint of the fundamental representation of SO2. I'm using here a bit of complicated group theory, but uh, well, that's it. And uh, so without any computations, just by thinking and knowing, we get to the conclusion that the main character of SO2 should follow the square somehow this big nursing. And that's the marching of us to law having this density. Once again, so uh, law from random matrices. Uh, this is the asymptotic law of complex Wishart matrices, very, very deep things. We'll get back to all this stuff in, uh, later on with probability. But importantly, yeah, that's. Uh, yeah, you can see, I mean, with SO2, SO3, you can have a lot of fun and you reach to this, these weird laws. The Wigner semi-circuit marching for posture, which are very important. So uh, okay, I can actually even stop here and work more on SO2, SO3. But we won't do it because it's too complicated. So let's get now to the simpler things. So these are supposed to be examples. So what's simplest is to do the general case. So let's just take a uh, close to group GNUN and try to see what we can do with it. So the first result is that it has a uniform integration, of course. And uh, well, that's actually quite tricky. If I want to prove it, you have to start with a probability measure on your group and convert it. And the more you convert it, the more uniform it will become. But this one converts, so you have to take as a limit as, uh, as indicated there. So that's your hard measure, it's independent of you. Equivalently, which is important, if you take any representation, you need a representation of the group, the integrals of the coefficients must form the projection onto the fixed points of rho. So see, this is independent and it's much better because it's independent of any kind of measure you can start with or whatever. That's 
the formula, the integration. Now, second thing, uh, well, we have all these Peter Weyer results. So uh, let's take a look at that. So they concern the finite dimensional smooth unitary representations. So all these omitting not for us, finite dimensional smooth and unitary, well, they will all be like this. There are four things. So uh, Peter Weyer's theory consists of four main results. First of all, is that uh, any representation decomposes as some of the reducibles, which are unique to equivalence. The second one is that now, if you want to look for irreducibles, it's enough to take the tensor products between the fundamental one and its adjoint. So the fundamental one is just the embedding, G inside you have. G comes like this, but regarded as a representation, as a faithful representation. So that's another thing. Now, third thing is that, uh, well, the algebra functions on G actually, the MC infinity functions. <coughs> <coughs> the linear span of coefficients of irreducible representations and uh, the coefficients when you take different irreducibles they are pairwise orthogonal. That is, you have a direct sum like this. And finally, the characters of your apps uh, are central functions on the group and form an orthogonal basis of the algebra of central functions. So that's the, the Peter Weiss theory. Now, with all this, uh, well, if you have characters here, so let's go back to. Uh, but we are computing in general these characters. So uh, given a closed subgroup, consider the character of the fundamental representation. And the moments uh, are given by this formula. So it's the dimension of the fixed points of flow to the K. Uh, K being, of course, well, uh, you see the character when G is orthogonal, this, this is something real. So just need to compute the usual moments, K is a positive integer. In general, it's a complex measure, so you have to compute uh, integrals of products of chi and chi bar. So that's why k must be also, uh, uh, I mean, it's a tensor product between the rho and its adjoint. Somehow it's rho to the k with k belonging to n uh, cross n. So here you have moments here. Yeah, that, that's basically what Peter Weil tells you. In order to compute the rho of the character, uh, well, it's enough to compute its fixed basis uh, dimensions. So, but if we get into that, the problem is that uh, this anyway won't apply to other things like truncated characters or individual coordinates. You see, it's something unique about characters. It comes from comes from here. Okay, so this is about representation of characters, and uh, for instance, for truncated characters, this technology don't apply. So, if we're getting into computations, yeah, we have to do some uh, some more theory actually. So, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely, we, yeah, let's go back here. This is beautiful and we'll use it, but uh, definitely is something more to integrate over G. Even if you want to compute the loss of truncated characters, it's like a very simple problem, why it's truncate there? It's not a character anymore, it doesn't fit into Peter Weiss theory. We really need to compute over the group. So let's see first what comes from Peter Weil. So uh, I get this abstract formula, which was uh, yeah, no too wide for people like that. It's very, very old. And well, it's been discovered by mathematicians or physicists uh, every 10 years or so. So here it is. Uh, well, let's try to prove it first so, because it might look complicated. So let's try to compute something like this on arbitrary integral over the group. So the point is that by Peter Weil, these guys here, when taken all together, uh, they form a projection onto this uh, fixed point space. Let's go back here. The construction of the higher measure, you see this result here. The integral for coefficients of representations, it's the projection, form altogether a projection to fixed points. So I'm using this. So these integrals here are just projections onto these things here. Now, assuming that we have a basis of this, okay? I'm taking a basis of these fixed points, assuming that we have it, we're able to compute it. Then we get a formula in the following way. So uh, the idea is that everything will depend on the basis. Uh, to be more precise, if you do the linear algebra, which is on the grammatics of the basis, and it's actually not the gram itself, but rather the inverse of the gram, which is called the Weingarten matrix. So here's your formula now. So assuming that the case of basis of these guys, you take the gram matrix, you invert it, and it's a sum of uh, entries like this with the coefficients, the, um, 
well, the, the elements of the basis express in terms of basic tensors, their coefficients. Okay. So that's your formula. It's a kind of pre Weingarten formula somehow. Now, well, so finally, we need to compute these fixed point spaces. It's all about this. So you see, before, let's go back. For, for comparing characters, we need to compute the dimension of these fixed spaces. For integrating in general, we need to compute the basis of these fixed spaces. So there's no problem now. I mean, you take a group like ONUN or SN, SUN, how to compute these fixed spaces, and it's hard. I mean, it's not uh, easy. So for this, you have to use a uh, Tarakian duality. So uh, the idea is that. Instead of looking at fixed spaces, let's look more generally at the home spaces between uh, rho k, rho l. Uh, it's, it's basically the same thing. I mean, we have some kind of forbidden use, but it's better to be this way because these guys here from a category. And you can uh, compose arrows. These are like arrows now, okay? You can compose the make tensors, everything. So it's a tensor category. Now, conversely, given a tensor category, abstract somehow, can associate with exactly the group of matrices such that the elements in your tensor category intertwine the tensor powers of your matrices. So as you have correspondences, and Tarkian duality tells you that, uh, well, of course, we need good axioms for everything for these categories. Uh, these are in bijection with compact groups and Tarkian categories. So this is very good. It's something quite powerful. It's, it's on a bit uh, level about Peter Weil. Now, uh, how to apply this for when you and everything? Well, <laughs> you have to go still one, one level up now. It's a lot of series here, but that's it. You cannot do Weingarten integration without understanding all these things. So let's call a, a group easy when these home spaces are in the Tarkian category is spanned by partitions like this. So uh, any partition I can associate a linear map in this way. Or you just plug in a tensor and the output tensor the coefficients. There are just some chronic air symbols. You take the partition, put indices on legs. This is the blocks. If the, all the indices in any block are equal, your chronic air is one. If something fails somewhere, I mean, in a block, two indices are different, your chronic air is zero. So you see that uh, partitions act on tensors in very simple, uh, this very simple way. I mean, this is just some zero one, guys, some very simple formulas. The quantum group is called easy when the Tarkian category appears in this extremely simple way from partitions. So let's see some examples of this first, and then we'll get to my garden. So uh, when you end that we're interested in, and actually H and N K and two, you know, to have a nice picture are all easy. The category is being as follows. So for when we get the pairings, which is important to remember, we get pairings in connection with the uh, the normal or the moment, so yeah, here they are the pairings. Then you also get pairings, but this time uh, you have to pairings are colored with two colors, and pairing, pairings must match the, the colors because it's complex. You have both you have the conjugation operation there, so it's something a bit uh, a bit smaller. For H N, you get a pair of partitions with the, all the blocks have even size. And KN, you get this calligraphic P when I mean, matching the partitions. So this is this result is yeah, some all comes from Tanaka. It's also known as survival duality or uh, Brouwer algebra or basic easiness. I mean, as I was telling you, these things are every every now and then, every ten years they are rediscovered. So they they have many many names. I think everything. Uh, can be attributed to, to people like Mobile and Brower. I mean, they, they knew everything before the, the war. All these things. Now, on the discrete side here, uh, there are some, uh, some other remarks on the discrete side. Uh, you actually have the whole series of refraction groups. So, for instance, SN itself, it's easy coming from the category of all partitions. That's a particular case of this. But here, for things to be beautiful, uh, We'll just keep these four things, these are some of the main objects. The symplectic group now is not exactly easy, but the so called super easy in a technical sense. We we'll won't talk about this, but can be investigated uh, with this, these techniques by modifying these things. 
are there remaining groups? What uh, what's left? Well, SVN, SVN and in the discrete case, you can uh, add this D parameter related to the determinants. So the only one that determinant that are not is definitely not easy. I mean, no matter how, how to how you look at the problem, it will never be easy. So uh, the determinant is something quite quite special, doesn't fit into this theory because it cannot be implemented somehow by a uh, by partition. So once we have this, uh, yeah, let's uh, let's look now at the Weingarten formula. So let's go back a few slides here. Integration formula. So here we have a basis now. In the easy case, we have the basis consisting of partitions. So it's going to be the same formula, but the grammatics and the chronic care symbols will be something very simple. So what we get, the grammatics is simple, simply n to the blocks of the joint phi and sigma, and the chronic cares are the, the usual ones. But why it follows exactly, it follows from the, the previous formula. I just plug in this, uh, this basis here to compute the scalar product. You get this, just number of blocks. And also the, uh, these chronic cares are, are those here by definition. So that's the Weingarten formula. It's the general formula in general for integration over a arbitrary compactly group. But in the easy case where we have an explicit uh, basis. So it looks the same, but the, uh, components here are, uh, are these guys. So this is a bit heavy, but uh, well, that's it. I mean, if you want to, you can of course ignore what I said before. So that's the proof somehow. You can just use this and input from here. If you want to compute over one, for instance, you take all the pairings, plug in here, invert. That's something that your laptop does for you. And then use the formula here. So it's a, uh, comes from uh, quite heavy things, but uh, in practice is very, very simple to use. So some applications, of course, with this you can compute everything. So let's go back to it here. You can uh, truncate the characters, whatever. This, this is compute all the integrals over your group. So you get, for instance, for truncating characters uh, in the large and limit, you get these loads here. So at left, we already know we get the best of things. You can reprove it with my garden if you want. And that's right, which is something new. You get the, the normal law, G standing for Gauss, and the complex normal law. That's our convention, the complexes with the capital letters. And importantly, so that's new. I mean, uh, we only knew this at uh, T is one now for, for the arbitrary design art of things. And you have as well independence results. You can prove that coordinates are independent when it goes to infinity. This is a really a uh, interesting so uh, last time we talked a bit we, we, you can prove a little bit of these results by using these tricks with spheres but for independence or for to get the characters you cannot use the trick the spheres we have to do it this way this way so this is basically stuff by uh, yeah by uh, by Benoit which is Niani and me and uh, many others by Benoit colleagues now, as a comment, of course, on the left side, well, we can do it for uh, for all the reflection groups, but it's something that we already know. It's false also for inclusion exclusion. So uh, let's leave it like this. In the continuous case, of course, uh, beside the NVM, we have some other easy groups. But uh, as I told you from general algebra, philosophy tells you that uh, that's all along the symplectic group or some transformation. So, for instance, you have them for the bistochastic groups. Real and complex, but also these are, these are actually some versions of NUM, so uh, they are interesting. But uh, well, the algebra group, uh, thirty point of view, it's basically the same thing. And you can also do this kind of computation for the symplectic group, which is very easy, but it's a bit more complicated. So as a conclusion, once again, so Peter Weil theory gives a theoretical formula for the integral, which is as old as as Weil. And uh, Brower and the others. In the easy case, this is the Weingarten formula, very concrete. This goes back to Brower actually. But the easy net checks here, yeah, it's always this Brower, Schulweil, Tanaka, and you may call it. So, uh, and all these things are related. There's something to be proved there. And uh, well, once you have easy net, service falls from Weingarten, you can believe me. So, all these computations, of course, I was very quick here. I didn't really tell you how to apply the 
find Ayrton formula and all that in order to get this, but we'll, uh, we'll do all this in the next lecture. So, the free probability and we'll do exactly these computations in the free case, but in the classical case, to do them with more, uh, more details, I'll uh, show details. Okay, so that was it. Very nice. I was concluding on uh, really a lot of farm finite groups, the uh, household compact groups, and we'll have some more. And I always remember, yeah, a group is not an abstract thing. It's a subgroup of the entire matrices. That's the future. Okay, see you soon for uh, for the next lecture on free probability. Bye bye.